Hey everyone, thanks again for joining me for yet another episode of Just Josh. I'm your host, and as always, I'm going to take you around my favorite city, New York, to show you some of the most interesting, fun-filled, crazy people and places that perhaps you would never have guessed. So today, I sit down with British pop star Ellie Goulding, or is it Goulding? I'm sure I mispronounced it, but I hope she'll forgive me. She is an up-and-coming star that you're sure to hear about, and she's going to take the world by storm. I also sit backstage with Beth Level, one of my favorite Broadway actresses, and talk to her about her hit musical, Baby It's You. But first up, I sit with choreographer Rennie Gold to talk to him about his dance troupe and their super cool initiative on anti-bullying. If you have seen the show before or you've heard me speak, you know that one of the things that I love most is when art makes a difference. And the Gold School, a Massachusetts-based dance academy, has created a really powerful work that promotes anti-bullying, tolerance, and acceptance. And with me today to tell us all about this extraordinary piece is artistic director Rennie Gold. So thank you so much for coming in and telling us about this. And like I said, it, it's kind of extraordinary that it's all danced by young performers. It actually started out as one piece for a performance we were gonna do about bullying, and it grew. We got ourselves involved with a man called Kevin Epling, who lost his son to Bully Side. And he inspired us to create pieces that tell the stories of people who haven't survived, and to tell stories to encourage kids and young people in schools that it does get better, and they just need to hang on. How did you actually come together, and, and at what point did you decide, you know what, this is something I really need to tackle? Well, when we did our first piece, my assignment, it was with five boys, and my assignment to the boys was, I need you to go out and I want you to find victims of bully side, and I want you to come back to next week's rehearsal with their stories or how you feel about their stories. And the first boy to speak spoke of um, Matt Epling, who is Kevin's son. And um, at that moment, I kind of lost it because a lot of things came up for me when I was bullied as a child. And through the process, this young man contacted Kevin Epling through email, told him what we were doing. Kevin contacted me, and um, he has been a mentor to this project since, since that time. And have you encountered any sort of resistance along the way? We tried to take it into schools. And our first school we were booked into was a junior high school. We talk about the subject of suicide in the show. And when they came to see our first Boston performance, which was prior to their performance, they wrote me back and wrote us a new script for one of the pieces that talked about Bully Side. And the boys had actually written that piece themselves. So I went in and talked to the boys and I said, what do you want to do? And they said, we don't want to change it. So I kind of explained to them that maybe we need to do this more at a high school level because this is a tough issue for parents to deal with. Um, what was kind of shocking to me was that the objection was if you talk about suicide, you'll put it in the kid's head. So, you know, th there's been some resistance, but uh, the people who have been supportive way overwhelm any kind of resistance we've come to. How long did it take you to go sort of from the concept stage to sort of actually completing your first piece and then certainly the larger piece of Except Me? The process started in October last year, and the first performance of Accept Me was in April. So the first piece actually only took about four or five rehearsals. Wow. 
from there, all the other pieces and parts of the show came together. And the choreographers who work with me and the kids, we all kind of joined together to come up with ideas to make our point. In the end, we have an hour and 45 minute performance that um, gives you the facts, but also when you leave the performance, you feel like you want to do something about it. And what about the kids? I mean, how has the reaction been? I mean, it's, it's a very, very heavy subject. Like we said, there are kids as young as six involved in the piece all the way up to 16, 18. 18. It's been an intense process for them, for sure. Uh, after our first Skype session as a group with Kevin Epling, you know, it had all been outside looking at it. Mm -hmm. Then as a group, it spurred a conversation sitting on the studio floor and they spilled their guts about what they had gone through and what they are currently experiencing and had experienced. I learned of a girl who was dancing with us who lost her best friend to suicide last year, a mentor to her. So the group grew so close as a unit, not only do they dance together, it, it's a it's a feeling from here that that we've all been through together. They saw me go through that process with them. It is mainly dance, but there is a lot of dialogue included in the dance. The styles of dance are from modern to musical theater. I kind of like to say it's a cross between a Broadway show and a dance concert, okay? The difference in the dance concert is it's a continuous show. The energy, the, it's like a roller coaster ride in some ways because when we hit hard, we worked really hard to bring you back up a little bit afterwards. And some of the most moving pieces in the show always have are followed by with what you might be able to do to help the situation. I like to say you're gonna laugh, you're gonna cry, and you're gonna wanna walk out of that theater and do something. And that's the message, is that and you, you wanna move people to, to do something. One of the things I learned from Kevin, he taught me that it's like throwing a rock in the pond and you try and get as many ripples as you can. And I like to think of this as a giant boulder, you know? It's, and it's, here we are in New York, ready to go to the Joy. so. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing stuff. And I think we should definitely add that um, the proceeds from the performances certainly go to... The Pacer Foundation, uh, the Matt Epling Arts Scholarship Program, and um, the Trevor Project. And once you're done with the subject of bullying, what's your next big topic? I don't know, and I don't know that I want this to end. Maybe we'll continue with this topic, and then we'll move into some other things, but I think that I want to take this into schools more. I want to make DVDs for our educators to be able to use in their classroom, and things like that. So I see the Accept Me Project continuing to grow in the future. Fantastic. Well. Congratulations and the best of luck at the Joyce this weekend and thank you so much for everything you're doing and you truly are making a difference and like I said it's one of my favorite things and I'm really glad you found some time to come and chat with us today. Oh thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. I told you isn't he amazing and those kids are extraordinary so thank you. Next up, I sit in the dressing room with one of my favorite Broadway stars, Beth Level, and we talk about her new hit musical, Baby It's You. So check this out. I love my job. Today I'm backstage at the Broadhurst Theater in the dressing room of one of today's great Broadway leading ladies, Beth Level. You may recognize her from such shows as 42nd Street and Crazy For You, and of course her Tony Award winning turn in The Drowsy Chaperone. 
She's currently starring in Baby It's You as Florence Greenberg, one of the great icons of the music industry of the 60s and 70s. And thank you so much for having us in your dressing room. I'm, I, I get giddy when I come backstage. I I'm mean, so glad you're here. Oh. And I just have to say I love my job, too. <laughs> I love my job. I love my job. So we're lucky. We're very lucky that we love our job well, so much. Let's start with the show okay. because um, I saw it last week, as I mentioned. I loved it. And you were spectacular. Thank you. And how did you actually become involved initially with the show? I was doing... Um, Elf last year on Broadway and we share the same producers Warner Brothers produced Elf mm -hmm. I was sitting in what's called a 10 out of 12 which is when you're just sitting there forever and they're lighting one scene and fortunately it was a dance scene and I wasn't in it so I was just <laughs> misbehaving in the audience and uh, the producer Greg came up to me and he said what are you doing in January and I made a joke I said well the universe hasn't really informed me what I was doing <laughs> which is so code for I have no idea I'm, I'm completely unemployed and he was like, oh, I went, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not doing anything. I was like, why? And he said, there's a, a project coming around. I was just wondering if you'd be interested in it. And I, you did kind of hear shows mm -hmm. that are coming in or you have some, you know, kind of have a, you know, the pulse of the mm -hmm. community. And, and he said, it's called Baby, It's You. I'm like, w what? He said, I've never heard of that at all. And he kind of told me he'd been in California and he thought maybe there was a possibility it would open quicker than anyone expected. And lo and behold, I had an audition um, and a callback, and within three weeks, I had this job. Then we started rehearsal uh, last week in January, and it's been twirling ever since. We were talking about how fascinating this woman, Florence Greenberg, is, and then the, we also have the music of the Shirelles, so what a great combination for a Broadway musical. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> kind of a win-win. Well, when you read it, weren't you kind of, I mean, like, I, I don't know what it would be like to carry a show like Baby It's You, but did you ever at any point think, like, holy shit, like, I've got to carry this thing on my shoulders. Constantly. I mean, do you? Yes. I mean, Constantly. that's got to be really nerve-wracking, I think, as a performer. It's satisfying and intimidating, horrifying, and I wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> um, well, let's talk about Florence for mm. a second, because as I mentioned before we started taping, you know, I, I love the show and it was, it's fun and it's the kind of show, you know, you can bring your parents to, you can bring your grandparents, you know, everybody can come see the show. Yeah. But what struck me, um, being such a theater geek, is like, here's this incredible story of this woman. Right. I mean, and it's a really remarkable story of this housewife who says, hey, I'm going to do this thing with no experience. She becomes a huge success. success. And... She had to follow her passion. I find it just so unbelievable. That no one knows her. That A, no one knows her, and that she actually pulled it off. Exactly. And in your opinion, With you're... No, no experience. And she no support. She had no musical experience. She had nothing. But she knew what she did really well, and that was discover musical talents. She had a gift for that. How do you know that when you're cooking chicken soup? In the, I mean, well, how, what, is it like a revelation or something? All of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, I know that's going to be a number one hit on uh, the radio. She was doing this, you know, 40 years ago. Right. Did you find that relatable, I guess, Absolutely. as a woman? I mean, she sort of is this sort of pre-feminist model of exactly. a woman. Exactly. I think, and I, I would love to give her, her props for that. She really is ahead of her time. To be in her kitchen, realizing that... Uh, she was unhappy. She was in an un unhappy, unsuccessful relationship, and she made movement to find her authenticity. Mama said there'll be days like this. There'll be days like this, my mama said. And you, as an actress, like, and also as a mother mm -hmm. and has a family, and, mm -hmm. like, there's a certain amount of a sacrifice that had to come with that, Absolutely. and I wonder if you could relate to that, like knowing that you have to work every day, and we talk, you know, you have a place yeah. here, and you have a place in, mm -hmm. in Jersey as well. Yeah, the, the, our lives are kind of parallel in many, many ways, which was fascinating when I was reading it and discovering it and bringing the musical to life. There were times when I would just be a mess, just, just the cathartic <laughs> process of the whole thing, like. <laughs> but it, you know, that's why I'm an actor. That's why um, I love what I do. Wide open, but all that I can see she also had this crazy affair with Luther a, Dixon. Yeah, with a black man. With a black man in 1960. And there is a scene in the show where I guess you're in 
Georgia? Atlanta. Atlanta? Yeah. It's about staying in the hotels and, and I mean, again, she, every step of the way, this woman who was not, I, in my opinion, probably not prepared for these battles, rose to these challenges. Completely. I have many, many, many favorite moments. A lot of those moments are when I hear the audience go, oh. Or if I can get them ready to go, soldier, and they go, boy, and it's like, or a mama says, don't be dirty, like this. <laughs> but there's a moment that Alan and I, who plays Luther Dixon, created in Soldier Boy with the, with the director, that Luther and Flo are all, uh, really kind of exchanging vows and commitments to each other through pop lyrics. And that's always fun to do as an actor, to find depth in the storytelling when you're given pop lyrics. But lyrics like, mama said there'll be days like this, could not fit that scene or that storytelling more truthfully. So I, I love that, that's such a challenge. I think I would be remiss if we didn't talk about the girls who play the Shirelles. They're Come on, yeah, my children, my daughters. Yeah. Extraordinary, Aren't they fabulous? Yeah, they're really amazing. Yeah, and they don't sit down in the show either. No, they're, they're so, because they play a bunch of different parts mm -hmm. too, so, mm -hmm. um, but they're really, really lovely. And my last question for you is like, if you, if someone said like, okay, you cannot be an actress, <gasps> what would you do? Mm, that would be tough. Yeah? Um, I don't really have any other skills. <laughs> I don't believe that. I would have loved to have been uh, an interior designer. But sadly, it would have to all be my taste. Which, <laughs> <laughs> can you so everything would look like, like my taste. So, so that's I'm probably not really successful. Room, my, my way. way. <laughs> so you exactly. can give me your opinions, but they really won't matter. <laughs> because I only can do it this way. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Well, oh. we're very glad you're not I, anything but an actress. Thank you. I can't believe that this is my job. This is my career. I, I kind of pinch myself. I get paid to do this. And we are all fortunate we, to sort of receive the benefits of that. So thank Thanks, you. Josh. And best of luck with the rest of the run. And come on down to the Broadhurst Theater here on the Broadway. The show is Baby It's You, starring Beth Level. I promise you will have one of the best times of your life. So Baby check it out. Baby It's You, cha la 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 <laughs> Baby It's You. I have the best job. <laughs> <laughs>
when you're really busy and you've got loads on and, and everyone wants to meet you and it's, it's really lovely but at the same time um, it affects you like it, it kind of if, you're, if I'm like wandering around thinking wow this is awesome <laughs> <laughs> like it's just going to preoccupy me in a bad way I think so I just make sure that I'm always grounded. And did you ever have sort of the opposite where you were there were points in your career where you're like oh man this is just never going to happen what am I going to do like yeah well like when I for album came out before, like literally the, the week before it came out, I read like a terrible review and I was like, oh my God, this is the worst. Like, that's it, my career's over, I'm gonna kill myself. And then, um, like it just all happened, like in a, in a good way, like everything, everything went fine, the album's done really well. We re-released it and it did even better. And so like, that was silly. It was like something I shouldn't have read, but it really like affected me at the time. I was like, no. Well, I, I'm a firm believer do not read the reviews. Like, I, you're no, not, absolutely, I, but I like... didn't. I, I was a very naive girl when I got into this game, <laughs> and um, and now I'm like nothing can touch me. Well, let's talk about your recent album, The Light. It's so beautiful, and there's a song on it called The Writer, which I absolutely fall in love with. When I wrote that song, I think I arrived at my friend Johnny. He's a writer, and I arrived at his house like literally like in tears. I, it was a stressful time. I was, I had no money whatsoever. I was a student. I was struggling really badly, and um, on top of it, I, there was a guy I liked who didn't like me back, and it just kind of added to my like, oh, everything is rubbish. So I wrote this song because I, I think that people that seem to be afraid of like writing really just sad love songs, and that's kind of what it is. It, it's so beautiful, like I've been playing it over and over and over, <laughs> I'm like, uh-oh, am I going to fall in? I was just like, oh. Yeah. The video for Starry Eyed is so beautiful. The one with you and this very beautiful man sitting in a field. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's really he was, stunning. He was a really good sport, actually. <laughs> In terms of your show, like, what do you do to prepare for, like, you know, being on the road, and how do you stay so healthy and, and fit and all of that? It's quite hard to, but I make sure I eat well. I try and keep fit. I go to the gym. I run on the treadmill. I run outside. You have to. I do, I don't know how anyone can survive tour without it. Like, I have to rest my voice. I have to rest. I have to sleep a lot. Um, and I have to eat a lot and train and train a lot. Um, I mean, I try and eat as well as I can, but some days when I'm really hectic, I just you know just stuff a big muffin in my mouth, <laughs> like because you, you got to, you got to. Absolutely. And you have a, a very specific organization called Ellie Runs and, and <laughs> an organization. Well, you Sounds know, like it's organized. Dodgy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so tell us a little bit about that. When I started out. Um, the first, I think the video I did for BBC Sound of 2010, because when I found out I'd won, they said, can you do this video for us to like, you know, talk more about you and stuff. They were like, so what do you want to do? And I said, well, I'd quite like to run, that's my thing. So they got me running around the park and then like, it kind of made me think that how innocent it was, how nice it was to do that. And I, so I kind of just embraced it and embraced the fact that people were so interested in it. And so I said to my fans that I was going to take them running with me just so that they could do something different. And it's just really nice to know that I've got so many people, in, young people, into running in the UK because they would never have done it otherwise. Who are your musical influences? Like when you're growing up, like who did you listen to and who did you sort of emulate? The radio, all the time, I listened to the radio. My parents didn't have like, because my parents divorced when I was five. It wasn't like they both played, you know, like vinyl or like certain CDs, certain artists. There wasn't a moment of like hearing like a Beatles record and be like, oh my God, there was nothing like that. Um, I've kind of just been on this crazy journey of music and it's kind of what my album um, has amounted from. Do you ever feel like um, coming from England, do you ever feel that pressure of like, oh my God, you know, that sort of weight on your shoulders? No. Good. <laughs> <laughs> no, should I? I don't know. I don't know. Do Good. Maybe I should. I just, no. I'm, I, I work hard and I sing hard and I play hard. That's all I can do. Oh my God, I love her. And she's going to be huge. And you're going to be able to say you saw her right here on Just Josh. 
So anyway, that's about it for today. So I want to thank my guests, the choreographer Rennie Gold, and of course the amazing Beth Level and the sensational Ellie Golding. And remember, if you want to contact me, you can always reach me at justjosh at heartv.com. That's justjosh at heartv.com. And thank you for tuning in today. And until I see you again, remember, stay gay. Next, I sit with British superstar Beth, oh, Beth Level. <laughs> oh. On an adventure, bleh. What is it? Um, okay, ready? Hello, hello. Oh, yeah, okay. Oh, is it Goulding or Golding? Ow, oh, god damn it. That's the question. Is it Goulding or Golding? That's terrible. Okay, I should have just said, should have kept just going. All right. All right, so, you know, this is the section of the show where I generally just bitch about something that's on my nerves. And today, because it happens to be towards the end of summer, I'm gonna tell you what's on my nerves. The end of summer. We now live in a society where we live three months in advance. It was not even August 1st before there were back to school commercials and everything, get this for the fall. Can't I just enjoy my summer? It's so precious and it's so short. I hate being reminded that it's gonna end so soon. And here we are, right on the very tail end of it and I'm already like head first into fall. So, oh, it's so frustrating. But I'm gonna hit the beach one last time and, and eke out the last bits of sunshine and, and sand that I can, so it's not that bad. That's terrible. <laughs>